Okay. Well, I'll introduce myself. I'm Marcus. Hi, everybody. This is our first seminar. We're trying this uh, live and on Zoom. Let's see how that goes. Hope it goes okay. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that will be coming out uh, very soon uh, with uh, Tim Cohen, Carl Farnsworth, and Rachel House. It's on uh, Hamiltonian truncation effective theory. And I understand that I'm going to have to explain what the title means. So that will be part of the talk. So here's uh, an outline. Uh, I'll give an introduction where I'll explain what the title means. Uh, and then I'll talk about the uh, how we define the effective theory that we're talking about, um, how we match a diagrammatic expansion, some details of the matching, uh, how the works. And then I'm going to show you that it actually works with some numerics. And then at the very end, I'll if I have time, I'll make some comments about gauge theory and uh, give some conclusions. Okay. Okay. So, what is this uh, about? Uh, so, Hamiltonian truncation for, for me is a way of uh, trying to get to numerically study strongly coupled uh, quantum field theory. And so, to explain what it is, I want to uh, sort of contrast it with uh, the lattice, right? So, lattice QFT is the standard way, standard tool that we have for numerically attacking uh, um, field theories. And so what lattice QFT is to a theorist is that it consists of an IR cutoff, right? The IR cutoff is this finite volume. We take the theory, we put it in a box, the size L, okay? And then we put in a UV cutoff, right? Which is just uh, a lattice, of course, right? So we just, and now once we do this, we have uh, a theory with a finite number of degrees of freedom and we can put it on the computer. Okay, that's just, of course, the very basic. So what is Hamiltonian truncation? Hamiltonian truncation has exactly the same uh, IR cutoff. And we just put the theory in a box. Okay, but then for the UV cutoff, what we do is we do something very different. So we take the Hamiltonian of the theory, so this is the Hamiltonian based method, and we split it into some three parts plus an interaction piece. Okay, and the idea is not that the free piece is a good approximation, I'm interested in strongly coupled theories, but the free part is used to define the cutoff, namely, I have some energy eigenvalues of the free part. Sorry, so I I'm just going to label my the energy eigenvalues of the free part, and it's discrete because I'm in finite volume, right? And then I just restrict myself to states, uh, linear combinations of these states such that the, the energy is less than some E max. Okay, so it's an energy cutoff, right? So you're saying this is the basis, no matter how not right nonlinear it is. This is your basis. This, this is, is the basis, cutoff. exactly, right? And so the 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 so once I do that, the Hamiltonian is in fact a finite dimensional matrix now, right? Okay, but uh, so it's even a more drastic cutoff than the lattice. Because in the lattice, if I wrote down the Hamiltonian for a discrete system like this, it would still have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. But the intuition is that if I'm interested in some low energy observables, as long as E max is larger than the energy scale of those observables. I should be able to approximate them in this uh, truncated Hilbert space. So, so if I think of H naught as a bunch of oscillators, yeah, then, then, it will be. then you're you're not but you're not cutting it off at a specific place for each oscillator. So if one oscillator was high, another one was low, yeah, this still is, reach your maximum as a global. Right. I mean, this is point. the way to think about this is that this is the the total energy. Okay. Yeah. So I'll yeah. be doing exactly what you say. I mean, I'm going to be interested in theories where H naught literally is just a free field theory. So I can think of these as particles with some discrete momenta. And EI is just the sum of the energies of all of the particles. So the total energy is bounded by this. Okay. So this, this, uh, this approximation method has, has a history. So it was actually used for the first time by, by Fauci in the 1980s. Uh, that didn't get uh, very much attention. Then in the 1990s, uh, Zamolodnikov and collaborators 
uh, started using this method to study flows of 2D CFTs. And in that context, it was called uh, TCSA, truncated conformal space approach. And so that uh, did get a lot of study, but uh, pretty much just in the world of 2D RG flows. Uh, it was revived more recently in the 2010s by Richkoff and collaborators, and also by Emmanuel Katz and collaborators who were sort of applying it to light cones, to the light cone habitat. Okay, so there's definitely a history, uh, and there's also a history of uh, the problem that I'm going to, to be looking at, which is the problem of systematically constructing and improving this effective uh, finite dimensional effective panatonia. But I'll, I'll make some comments if people are interested at the end to compare to that work, because uh, this work I don't think is very familiar and I don't think it will be very meaningful for me to do those comparisons. But the, the executive summary is that our, our, our approach works much better than anyone else. Okay, so I'm not hiding, that's what I'm hiding from here. Okay, so but let's let's continue just a little bit with this comparison with the lattice and uh, and this Hamiltonian truncation. Uh, there are some pretty good reasons why you might think that there's this is this this that, that the lattice is better than uh, Hamiltonian truncation. Uh, one of them is that if we just look at the number of states, okay, that we have, that number of states will grow exponentially with U max, right? The fact that the number of states grows exponentially with the energy is the reason that SAT mech works, for example, right? It's very much built into uh, quantum field theory or any local theory. And on the other hand, the error that we expect to make uh, goes, would go like some inverse power you would expect with E max, right? Because we're integrating out states about some energy, and our experience with effective field theory tells us that the error should be some power. Obviously, the value of alpha is very important, and we'll talk about that. But this is this is correct. And so what we see from this, we put these things together, is that if you just start throwing more computational power at this Hamiltonian truncation, you're only gaining logarithmically in accuracy, right? Okay. So whereas on the lattice, if you look at the, 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 the computational cost of the various algorithms that people use in Monte Carlo lattice, uh, Euclidean lattice uh, quantum field theory, everything goes as a power law. On the other hand, they're pretty, they're pretty big power laws, so that's why they need those big computers, uh, but it's still a power law versus uh, an exponential. Right? So uh, you might think that this is hopeless, but in fact, when people have done concrete studies, there, there is an exponential wall. There's a point beyond which you just don't effectively don't get any more accuracy. But it turns out that one gets interesting accuracy uh, before you get to that point. Um, yeah, sure. Are you truncating the spectrum or are you integrating out the high energy state? I'm eventually going to be integrating out the high energy state. Relative to H naught or relative to full state? Relative to H naught. H naught is defined in my cutoff. Right? Okay. Okay, so so uh, so I, I just want to say that perhaps uh, it's obviously interesting to think about whether quantum computers can make a difference here because they are able to take some exponentially hard things and make them power law easy. Um, and there are other reasons also, I think, to 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 look at the Hamiltonian truncation. And I'll only be able to say a little tiny bit about this at the end, which is that uh, the which symmetries you can maintain on the lattice versus Hamiltonian truncation are, are very different, okay? And so, for example, uh, we've made some progress on uh, chiral gauge theory, okay? There's no known way to put any chiral gauge theory on the lattice, as far as I know. Um, also, supersymmetry, okay? Uh, there is some, you can do some things on the lattice, but it's very challenging. Uh, you'll we'll see at the end when I, I'll talk a little bit about chiral gauge theory at the very end if there's time. Uh, there are difficulties, but there are at least there are different difficulties. And as I said, I think we've made some some progress. Okay. And so my attitude toward this is that you know Hamiltonian truncation compared to the lattice. Well, the lattice has a 40-year head start, all right. And uh, and uh, but we should really try to push. Uh, 
push Hamiltonian truncation as far as you can go. Okay. And I believe that the main obstacle is the fact that uh, it's clear that this uh, Hamiltonian truncation is some kind of an effective field theory, right? Because I'm throwing away states that are in some sense high energy states, even though the energy is the energy measured by H naught. And so it should be some kind of an effective theory, but it has never been actually formally formalized, uh, uh, formulated in that way. Okay, and that's what we're going to be able to do. So I'll get rid of your question mark and put an exclamation point. So we we're going to be able to do that. Okay, and we're going to show that this actually gives uh, can systematically improve the accuracy of this uh, truncation. Okay, so basically the plan is to follow the playbook of effective theory, just effective field theory, step by step into this sort of novel situation, and. It's not completely straightforward. It's not just a, you know, you just it's not a homework exercise. Uh, there are some features, very unfamiliar features, compared to standard effective field theories. Uh, one of them is that the effective Hamiltonian that we're going to construct is non-local. Okay. Now at this point, if I'm going to talk and somebody says they're writing down a non-local effective Hamiltonian, I have a very strong urge to just get up and leave. Okay, because that generally means when people start about talking about non-local effective theories, they don't know what they're talking about. But I claim we do know what we're talking about. Uh, the origin of the non-locality is easy to understand physically. It's back here, right? The fact that the, the cutoff is on the total energy. So if there's some state, and I'm trying to decide whether it's in the effective theory or not, I have to add up the energies of all the particles everywhere in space including the ones on the moon okay so there's some there's so there at some level it's non-local okay so that, that that's fine another thing that looks uh, bad until you think about it is that that effective hamiltonian is not hermitian you say that's bad every hamiltonian i've ever seen in my life has been hermitian but remember here that again we're truncating the space based on the total energy measured by H naught. So uh, time evolution is generated by H and time evolution will mix states within this effective uh, Hilbert space and states outside. And so we expect that somehow, at least at sort of second order, when you mix out and mix back in, you would expect that the Hamiltonian would not be permission. And in fact, we find that to be the case. But the, the, the fact that the thing that's supposed to make all of this okay is that as we'll show there's a systematic expansion of all of these things <clears throat> uh, in, in this our basic variable one over e naught. Okay, so there is non locality, there is non hermeticity, but it's under control in some systematic expansion that we claim we understand. Okay, so the kind of theory that we're going to be applying this to. Is we're going to be applying it to some theory where we know we can basically h naught is a good approximation uh, in the uv okay so the simplest kind of theory that we're going to be talking about the one that we have numerical results for is just 2d mm -hmm. lambda phi 4 theory okay so that theory is strongly coupled because the uh, coupling constant has mass dimension 2 Right, and so it's very weakly coupled in the UV, but it's very strongly coupled in the IR. Uh, what do we know about this theory? We know that it has a second order phase transition, and that's a second order, the second order phase transition is in the Ising universality class, right? There's a Z2 symmetry under which phi goes to minus phi. But away from the critical point, this is a non-integrable hard to solve theory. Okay. And uh, that's the kind of theory that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Okay, and so the idea is that uh, V, the interactions are weak in the UV. Okay, and so we can just that means that the, the states of our E max are in some sense weakly coupled, and we can uh, compute the effective Hamiltonian in perturbation theory. Right, so we can determine H effective uh, in perturbation theory. That's going to be what we're going to do concretely. Okay. All right, and um, the way we're going to do this is by matching 
This is a standard uh, effective field theory thing. Matching is basically the idea that you have some complete set of low energy observables and you determine the coefficients in the effective Hamiltonian by requiring that they are reproduced. The effective theory reproduces the predictions for them uh, uh, from the uh, fundamental theory. Okay. And so the first question we have to ask is we want to match some quantities between these two theories. The first question is what should we match? Okay. And the most natural thing to say is well, you should just match the spectrum. Right, because really, when you have uh, uh, a finite dimensional Hamiltonian, this is a finite dimensional matrix, it, it, whatever observable you have has to make sense for the low energy theory. And it, it's not easy to think of anything other than the spectrum that you should match. Okay. But the first thing I want to tell you is that the spectrum is not enough. Okay. Matching the spectrum does not determine the effective Hamiltonian. Okay. And um, so to see that, let's let's just look at the, the, the let's just look at the spectrum. What happens if we match the spectrum? So here I'm going to introduce a notation for the exact eigenvalues. I'll use script E's for the exact eigenvalues. Okay. And uh, whereas I'm using That's supposed to be on, on the little bit of 13. Sorry. I had a question, but it's actually 13 in notation. Okay. Sorry. I don't want to call it the I. I guess we're just calling it I's. Okay. Okay, so 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 the EIs and the script EIs are not equal, but the idea of perturbative matching is that I would compute EI in perturbation theory. So at lowest order, it's E sub I plus call this E one I plus E two I, and so on, and E N I is some order V to the N contribution. Okay, and now the if I compute these E sub I's in perturbation theory. Uh, uh, and then, and then what I assume is that the affected Hamiltonian is some H naught plus H one plus H two, and so on, where H sub n is order v to the n. Okay, and then just the standard formulas that you know from quantum mechanics. I'm just computing energy eigenvalues in perturbation theory. Uh, you know that the first correction is just the expectation value of H one. The second one is something like sum over alpha. I H1 alpha alpha H1 I B I alpha plus I. Right? These are just formulas that you know. And here my sum only goes over the low energy state. So I'll put this little less than sign here. So you can see immediately that this doesn't tell you the full effective Hamiltonian. This only involves the diagonal elements of H1, right? And then if I go to next order, I start being sensitive to the off diagonal elements, but there's just this, I, I don't, I only determine the diagonal elements of H2, and this keeps going to all orders. So this is a very simple point, but this is actually, if you look at the literature on this, people are trying to find the exact or the improved effective Hamiltonian from matching to the spectrum. And I just, I think that will just, that will never give you a unique, uh, Effective Hamiltonian. And in fact, the previous work on this has involved inspired guesses for the effective Hamiltonian. Okay, so if we really want to determine it systematically, we have to match something else. Okay. And so what can we match beyond the spectrum? The uh, the, 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 the right guess is that it's something to do with time evolution, right? Because the spectrum only tells you what happens to the stationary states or some sort of weird quasi stationary states, but the, 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 there should be something about time evolution. And the, the, the right thing is to use that we found that works is uh, what we call the transition matrix. Okay. And it's something that's very closely related to the S matrix. If we were in infinite volume, right? We would use the S matrix, which does have something to do with time evolution over very long time, right? But the S matrix is not defined in finite volume. Uh, so we're going to use the transition, this thing called the transition matrix. And the way it's defined is we take V and we turn off the uh, turn off the interactions at late time. So we put in some uh, epsilon bigger than zero, and we adiabatically turn off the interactions at late time. And then what we define is we take the time evolution operator 
that goes from some t final, from t initial equals zero to some t final. Okay, and we just take the limit as t final goes to infinity. Right? This is some unitary matrix. Okay, now so far this is not uh, totally well defined because even when the interactions are turned off, you have infinite oscillations in the future. So we work in interaction pictures. Okay, so this is a very Hamiltonian like definition. And you can think of this as sort of one half of the S matrix. If you define the S matrix by adiabatically turning off the interactions, you turn them off at t equals plus infinity and minus infinity. Here I'm starting at t equals zero and going to t final equals infinity. <coughs> so intuitively, I'm starting with an interacting eigenstate, for example, and then I evolve as I turn off the interaction and watch it fall apart into a bunch of free uh, eigenstates. Okay. So uh, I don't really, the, the point of this thing is not that this is something I'm going to be calculating and saying it's important what it is. The point is that it's, this is a thing that I can match. It's just a stepping stone to my effective Hamiltonian. Okay. And as I said, this thing is roughly something like the square root of the S matrix, very much in quotes. Okay. And so now we can, uh, what you can do is you can just check that this thing has a very nice perturbative expansion in V. Okay. And in fact, it's very closely related to old fashioned perturbation theory, as you would guess, uh, because in, in old fashioned perturbation theory, you pretty much define the S matrix to be pretty much the square of sigma with some important differences. But and anyway, the perturbation theory is very much uh, uh, connected with that. And so uh, what we do is uh, we we define something. So just like in the S matrix, we take out the identity piece and the rest of the piece we call T. Okay. And I'm going to pull out this energy denominator. Okay. And then you can just work out that there's a very nice perturbative expansion for T. So for example, T uh, I F looks something like that um, uh, looks like F the i plus sum over alpha f v alpha alpha v i v alpha plus i epsilon plus you can probably pretty much guess the remaining terms and now you notice that this looks very very similar to the uh, energy uh, uh, the expansion in powers of v for the energies which i just showed up here but there's a very important difference, right? Which is that look here, I have the final and the initial state here. Okay, this, this transition matrix knows about the off diagonal terms of V. Okay. And at higher orders, you also notice that, of course, it has this feature, but it also has notice that there's X that appears here. So this is not symmetric under I goes to X, right? And that is built into the definition of this transition matrix, right? The initial and the final states are treated very differently. Okay. So beyond the order, beyond this very first term here, the uh, T matrix is uh, non permission, and that corresponds to sigma being non unitary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just in the sigma, for example, T F goes infinity example in that if I take T I also go to minus infinity, does that reproduce that matrix? No, I mean the, the problem is it's a so if you have a uh, a finite volume yeah. and you leave the interactions on for uh, for an infinite amount of time, right? What happens is things just bounce around. Time evolution is sort of periodic, right? And so you don't have a transition, really, right? And finite volume, uh, for example, right, we're, we're used to the idea that particles decay, but they don't inverse decay, right? Why is that? Well, it's because once a particle decays, the particles go off to infinity. But if we are in finite volume, the particles would go off and come back, we would eventually have inverse decay, and the thing would happen an infinite number of times. Okay. Uh, well, if I take this, uh, this uh... Yeah, I think if you wanted to get the, the, you have to take these limits in the right order though, somehow. Okay. 
So, I mean, we really want to match to the finite volume theory. So, for our purposes, I think this is the right thing. Okay. Because we really want to work in finite volume. At the end of the day, we're going to, going to show you results of diagonalizing, you know, 30,000 by 30,000 matrices, something like that, right? And so, we, we have to really work concretely in finite volume. Okay. And you don't really care everything physically about this thing. You just need it as a matching tool. That's right. That's right. I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't claim I, this is a perfectly well-defined thing. It has a good perturbative expansion. I don't see why it's not well-defined non-perturbatively. So it's just a convenient thing. It, it, it took us a long time. These 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 two things, the, the effective Hamiltonian, especially the fact that the effective Hamiltonian is non-permission, that was a big psychological barrier to figuring out the right thing. We tried many other things that, that didn't work before we came out of this. So there might very well be something else that also works. Okay, I, I, I'm not claiming that either, but this is the thing that we found that does work. Okay, so now um, I want to talk about, I want to to make this thing very concrete, I want to talk about uh, 2D lambda phi 4 theory. Okay, right? So the, the, the formalism is general, but it's easiest to explain in terms of an example. And so here, H naught is just some sum over K, omega K, A dagger K, A dagger. So it's just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And omega K is uh, K squared plus some mass. And I'll explain the notation. This mass we call the normal ordered mass. Okay, well, it's not that hard to understand why. Now, the radius of our space has been set to one, so I just have some fewer factors to, to worry about. Okay, and the uh, the interaction can just be written like this: lambda over four factorial uh, phi to the four. Okay, normal ordered phi to the four. So this theory is, is simple because once I've normal ordered in this way, uh, then the uh, the theory is completely finite, right? So I don't have to worry about any UV divergences. Uh, later on, I'll say some things about theories that do have UV divergences. Um, but it turns out that even for this theory, even though it's somehow the, the UV divergences can all be absorbed in normal ordering and are in some sense fake, it is actually useful to uh, to compare the results of this normal order thing to uh, a more conventional renormalization scheme where you have infinities and counter terms and so on. And um, so let me just, uh, so how would you define the renormalized mass if you were not normal ordering? It would be equal to the bare mass that appears in your uh, Hamiltonian. And then there would be some sort of one loop tadpole type diagram. The only kind of divergences are things like this. And that's why they can be absorbed in normal ordering. But if I ignore that and just do regular normalization, I would get something like this. Then I would have some K. And notice I'm in introducing a renormalization scale mu here. That's telling me what part of this diagram, uh, what part of these uh, vir you know, virtual momenta here am I uh, absorbing into the counter term versus leaving in my renormalized theory. So I'm doing something like summing over k larger than u, then over omega k. Okay. So this is what you would get in finite volume. Okay. And uh, what you, you can see just by comparing this with the normal order case, this normal order mass that appears here is the renormalized mass at mu equals zero. Okay. So normal ordering is like conventional renormalization where the renormalization scale is at zero. Okay. And the reason that that's important is because when we do effective field theory, you're always told to take the renormalization scale to be of order the matching scale, not at zero. And that's important to uh, get separation of scales. So separation of scales is very important to us. Okay. And that's why I'm talking about this. So separation of scales is the intuitive idea is that the coefficients of the effective Hamiltonian are sensitive only to physics above the cutoff, right? And the and they parameterize the physics below the cutoff, right? And we'll see that that has a very precise meaning in perturbation theory. But the point is that for separation of scales, we're going to see that it only works if we take mu of order e max, as we expect in uh, from general. Effective field theory ideology. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So now I want to, uh, I'm going to get nerdy on you. Okay. So I want to look at uh, the diagram in this theory. Okay. So I'm going to just, I'm going to actually do an example of a diagram and before your very eyes to try and illustrate, to try to illustrate the, the features of this diagrammatic expansion. I'll, I'll be able to point out some of the important physics that comes out of this. Okay. So we draw diagrams like this. Okay, and uh, uh, of course we have a derivation of this, but I'm just going to uh, uh, try to make it plausible by giving an example. Okay, so we have some external state here. Now remember that what we're trying to calculate is we're trying to calculate uh, some matrix element of T. That's what these rules give us, right? And these initial and final states could contain a lot of particles. It could contain hundreds of particles, right? But at any given order in perturbation theory, only a few of these particles can actually interact. So there are actually a bunch of particles which I'm not drawing as part of the diagram in general that go just go through like this, right? So this is the initial state, and this is the final state here, right? But I'm not, I don't know, they contain no information, so I don't draw them. Okay. And then let me just tell you what this particular diagram is. In our in our rules, okay. So this is like old-fashioned perturbation theory. So the, the 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 states are ordered, okay. So I can sort of think of time as going this way, okay. And so this state is the initial state here, and I have some intermediate state alpha here, and I have some final state here, okay. Okay. And so what is it? Well, there's some sort of symmetry factor. There's some powers of the coupling. Okay. Then there is, we assign a momentum to every line, just like we do in ordinary perturbation theory. So we'll assign five and six to these internal lines. You sum over all of the internal and external momenta. You put in, these are the, these are the spatial momenta, right? This is like an old fashioned perturbation theory. We, uh, conserve spatial momentum that energy is not conserved, right? So these are the spatial momenta, which are just numbers in one plus one dimension. And we have some delta functions, one, two, five, six, and uh, five, six, three, four. They just in enforce momentum conservation at each vertex. And then we have the matrix element. This guy right here corresponds to a uh, final state particle with an A4 dagger uh, A3 dagger A2 A1. Okay, so these are creation and annihilation operators. Notice they're normal ordered. So this is the piece that takes away particles one, two, and replaces them by particles three, four. Then we have some propagator factors, which are for us two over omega five, two over omega six. Those are the internal lines. Okay, and then finally we have an energy denominator. And that is E F alpha plus uh, I F. Okay, that's that diagram. You can sort of see what you can sort of see from that what the uh, Feynman rules are. Okay, now that is the Feynman diagram. Uh, uh, okay, so let me just say, and, and and what is E F alpha? Right, E F alpha is the difference between the final. The, the energy, the final state, and the energy of alpha, right? But it's a, it's an energy difference, so I can just write it in terms of the uh, frequencies of the particles that interact. Namely, I can write this as omega three plus omega four minus omega five minus omega six, right? So in other words, I don't really need to know what EF is, right? I just this is an energy difference, and that means I don't really need to know what all those other particles on the moon or whatever are, right? Okay. But that's because I showed you, gave you the value of this diagram in the fundamental theory where there's no cutoff. Okay. So suppose I was instead asking about this thing in the effective theory. Okay. In that case, I actually have to multiply this by some step function so that I only include uh, states uh, below the cutoff, Emax. So I have some Emax minus 
E alpha, right? My intermediate state cannot be above the cutoff. Okay. And so now uh, you can just see after a little bit of algebra, I could write this as E max minus, uh, I guess, plus E F alpha minus E F, right? I can write it like that if I want. And the reason I'm writing it like this is because uh, E F alpha, that's an energy difference. I can write that in terms of these omegas. But here I have this leftover E F. And here I need to know about the particles on the moon. Okay, so this is where it comes in. And so the, 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 the non-locality enters in a very precise way here. It enters only in these uh, set functions that cut off the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sums of the states. Okay, and that's as it should be if you think about it. Where else would the non-locality come from? It comes from the cutoff. And this is how it comes in. So the claim is everything else here can be computed without knowing about the, the full details of the, the final state. Okay. All right. Um, and now just to, to finish up with the, the, the rules, just to emphasize, these rules are very different from, these are not like ordinary Feynman rules. So for example, the um, you should think of the vertices as being ordered, right? They're ordered from left to right. And also there's no symmetry between initial and final states, right? And so for example, this, would be a different diagram. Okay, so here's the diagram that would be topologically the same as the other one if you could identify initial and final state particles. But if you work out this diagram, it's different. And you can even have things like this, for example, four to zero things, because remember, we're only conserving momentum, not, not energy. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> when you do this perturbation theory, it's a strongly coupled system. So your perturbation theory is some scheme for comparing power without really arguing for right. convergence. Right. So does that scheme um, get disrupted by this one you kind of thing? Does your trust in in this sort of order by order comparison? Um, yeah. So I mean, the, 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 you raise a good point, which is you know uh, I haven't actually explained. Well, I'm doing perturbation theory, and yet I'm saying this is some strongly coupled theory. Does that really work? Okay, I'm going to explain that, but let me just tell you uh, uh, an analogy, which is the one I always think of is, uh, is is that of integrating out a top quark in QCD. Okay, so the top quark has a mass of 170 something GeV. It's far above the scale where QCD gets strong, and we can perturbatively integrate out the top quark. Okay without knowing the full IR dynamics of QCD, which in fact we don't know. And so how do we develop that? We just develop a perturbative expansion, right? For how to expand in powers of the strong coupling, right? That's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm not worrying about does it converge? I'm just working, working out what is that expansion. But then when you integrate out the top quark, uh, and, and we'll see this here in just a second, what you find is that the matching is sensitive to the difference between the UV and the IR theories. And the IR part, which we don't know, we don't understand theoretically, and QCD just cancels out. So we end up getting a good perturbative expansion for the quantity that we calculate. Okay. But you always have to check in perturbation theory. Perturbation theory works for some things and not for others. So the claim is that indeed perturbation theory does work for the thing that we're going to calculate. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. So this is like the chapter in the QFT textbook where you learn Feynman diagrams, right? And you just have to learn it to do anything else. Okay, but now I do want to exactly answer that question. So what happens when we match? Okay. So when we match, remember we're equating the effective and the fundamental theory plus some counter terms in the effective theory that we're determining. And so what that means is that in this diagram that I showed you, we would actually be sensitive to the difference of the diagram in the fundamental theory and the diagram in the effective theory. Okay, so let's just write that out. Okay, and so what is that? There's some coupling. Might as well put the right coefficient. Okay, and then there's some one through four. And then again, I have this matrix element A4 dagger, A3 dagger, A2, A1. 
Okay. And then I have the part, this is sort of all the external state stuff. This is like the stuff that you factor out, right? And then you have some, uh, the internal loop part is uh, five, six, five, six, uh, three, four. So here I'm again using the same kind of labeling. And then I have some, uh, uh, I have some, some theta function, some step function. And what does that say? It's omega five plus omega six minus omega three minus omega four. You know, this is a little detail, but you know. Okay. Um, plus the yeah, minus two max. Okay. And then I have omega five, omega six, omega three plus omega four minus omega five minus omega four. Okay. So that, that's it actually in all of its glory. But now uh, all of these, there's a lot of things here, there's a lot of momenta and so on, but they're not all created equal, right? Because remember that I'm interested in a low energy expansion. So that means that omega one through four and also EI and EF are all much smaller than E max, right? I'm interested in low energies, okay? And uh, so that implies, if you look at this theta function right here, this theta function actually needs this linear combination of energies with the final to be bigger than E max, right? That makes sense because this thing involves the sum over all energies. This involves the sum of energies only up to E max, right? And so the difference is sensitive to the energies above E max, which is exactly what we want. So what that means is because of this uh, momentum conservation here, right? Uh, that means that omega three and omega four are small, basically K five plus K six is zero, right? So that tells me that omega five and omega six are above E max. Okay. So now knowing that I can say, okay, they're big and they're small, right? Let me neglect, let me keep only the big, big energies and momenta. There's this guy, right? There's these guys. Uh, e max is big, right? And omega five and omega six are big. Everything else is small, right? So in the leading approximation, I can just set this stuff to zero, right? So I can just set the leading approximation, I can just set this to zero. And that we call the local approximation because this will give us a local effective Hamiltonian, okay? So now you can see this thing is really a series in uh, these external things. And so now you can just do this diagram plus the other ones with all the other legs going all over the place. And what you find is you get a term dx lambda two over four factorial normal order, okay? And you find that this diagram plus its friend gives you minus three lambda squared over 16 pi, sum over k, theta. Now it's much, much simpler, two omega k minus e max, and omega k two, okay? So you get something very, very manageable. And this is such a simple sum, you can even uh, do it uh, exactly, or at least perturbatively in powers of e max. So this gives you minus three lambda squared over four pi, E max squared plus some high order terms in one over E max. Okay. So at the end of the day, it's a lot like perturbative matching, except you have a weird bunch of diagrams and uh, uh, and that's it. Okay. Any questions on on that? Now um, here, I, this kind of makes it look a little bit too easy. So I've got to show you that it's not really that easy, okay? Because if we look at uh, phi squared instead, uh, one of the diagrams that we have to do looks like this, right? It's a two root diagram, right? Because it's still order V squared. And so the, a diagram like this has some overlapping UV IR regions. So for example, you could have a large loop momentum here and a small loop momentum here, okay? And so you get these overlapping UV IR regions and this these regions are the reason that for example perturb proving actually rigorously proving perturbative normalizability took like 20 or 30 years right um, so in in our case here 
the, the way that they appear is that they 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 um, they obscure the separation of scales, right? See, this contribution here was simple because at the diagram level, it already only depends on the UV state, so it was easy. This one does not do that. And in fact, the, uh, the, 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 the as, I, as I sort of mentioned before, this cancellation actually only works. So if I write H2 like this, and have M2 squared phi squared plus lambda over four factorial out of the four. Okay. And notice that these are not normal orders now. Okay. Uh, so this is still the same lambda two because lambda four normal ordered is lambda four plus some, some proportional to lambda squared. But it is the it is the non-normal ordered coefficient of phi squared. It is m2 squared m2 squared evaluated with u e of order m max e max that has the property of separation of scale. Only that. Okay. And again, that is what you would expect from uh, from uh, general effective field theory considerations. And this comes about between from non-trivial cancellations between this diagram and other diagrams that come in. Okay, which I won't really talk about unless somebody really is interested. Um, and then there's even uh, a three-loop diagram. Uh, okay. That has uh, that we also have to worry about. That has even more different UVIR regions, and once again, they do cancel when to do things in the correct way. Okay, so these are these are things that sort of work. The separation of scales works due to some non-trivial cancellation. Okay. Okay. Good. This is going to be shape. Okay, so now I need to tell you what the expansion is that we're actually doing. Okay, this is just, well, sorry, actually, no, I, I, I told you that, that. So I think the answer to your question is that the separation of scales means that when I calculate this quantity, I just see that it's sensitive only to these UV states. That's what the separation of scales means. And so that tells me that I think that my expansion is good. Okay. Okay, so now let me say what is the uh, what we really care about is uh, non perturbative <coughs> calculations of low line uh, quantities right and so uh, i'm going to tell you what we believe is the structure of this uh, this effective Hamiltonian so let's look at HN remember that those are the terms that are of order V to the N right okay. And I'm going to tell you what, I, what we claim as the structure of these things. So first of all, there's a factor of lambda to the n, just because that's what it means, right? And uh, over e max to the two n minus two, two, yeah, two. Okay. So this is just some dimensional factor that makes the Hamiltonian have dimension in that. Okay. And then it has the form d x. Okay. Uh, times some sum, uh, some sum, uh, some operators with some coefficients, C and A, right, times some operators, O and A. Okay? So this is sort of familiar from, uh, uh, you know, this is what you expect for an effective field theory. But now, what do these things depend on? So C and A depends, uh, is dimensionless, the way I've defined it. So it depends on the ratios of all of the dimensional scales that are in the problem. So one of them is R inverse divided by E max. There is M divided by E max. Okay. And then there's also, this is the really new feature, okay, is H naught divided by E max. Okay. And then these operators are functions of phi. Phi is dimensionless. And then there are derivatives divided by E max. Okay. So in other words, the operators are just a bunch of local operators, which uh, right, and things with more derivatives have more powers of one over the max, as we expect. And if I didn't have this, this would just be what you would get in an ordinary effective field theory, namely the coefficients or functions of the dimensionless parameters divided by the color. Okay. The new feature is this, right? 
I'm saying that the so this effective coupling is really an operator, and in fact, it can depend on the total energy or the H naught, the unperturbed energy. Okay. And the reason for this is goes back to this thing that I showed you over here, back here, right? Uh, here, okay. So here I kept only the big things, right? And I and I left off all of these small things here. But what I should really do to go to higher orders, I'm going to expand in powers of these things. So I'm going to get an expansion that gives me powers of EF, for example. And EF is the same as H naught acting on the left, right? And so those powers of H naught are there to give to, to parameterize this effect in the diagram. Okay. And that's where the non locality is hiding because you know H naught is itself an integral of dx over some. Right, so this is uh, this is non-local, okay. but it's a it's a very controlled non-locality, uh, as you can see. Okay, so now if we look at H two, just to see this concretely, um, so I look at H two. What do I get? Okay, so according to this power counting, I would get some phi squared plus phi fourth term. Now dimensional analysis would allow phi to the one million. But there's no diagram for that, right? I mean, I'm working at order lambda squared. I can only write something with, with at most four powers of the field. Okay. So then, uh, then I have uh, terms that look like uh, R inverse over E max plus uh, H naught over E max. Okay. And these can have things like one plus pi squared plus pi to the four. Okay. And then I can have terms that are actually linear and derivatives. I can have something like chi chi dot over E max, okay, chi plus chi cube. Okay, there's a phi goes to minus phi symmetry, so I have to have even powers of phi. Okay, and um, uh, yeah, and then I get even higher order terms, right, which would be suppressed by at least one over E max squared. Okay, okay. And then you can check that the higher order ones, for example, H3 starts at order one over E max to the fourth. And just by writing things out. Okay. So what we what you notice is that if I didn't include H2, the error that I would expect based on this power counting is I would expect a one over E max squared error, right? Now I we've actually calculated the leading contributions. To H2, namely these, okay, just these actually, okay, and we see that the remaining corrections, the ones we haven't calculated, they're down by one more power of E max, or these or even more, okay, and so what that says is that what we should expect is that if we don't include H2, we should get an error of one over E max, order one over E max, and if we do, we should get an order of one over E max squared. Or, or sorry, one over sorry, the other way, sorry, I said it wrong. The error would be one over E max squared if we didn't include it versus one over E max cubed if we did. Yeah, sorry. And you never get like log of H one over E max is always polynomial. Yeah, in this theory, because we have a dimension full coupling, there's no logs. It wouldn't be in, in ordinary perturbation theory either. Okay. Um Actually, sorry, sorry, no, 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 sorry. It's a little more than that. It's the fact that the theory is basically finite, that there's no log. So, in for example, if you looked at phi four theory in three D, there are logs. Okay, so I'm I'm not going to have time to show you that, but I could show you the similar power counting for phi cubed in in three D, and there there are logs. Okay. So yeah, it's the fact that the theory is is, is finite. Okay, so now I'm going to try to. Show you some plots, try and show you that this actually works. Okay. So, okay. All right. So, first of all, uh, here, what we've done is we've chosen some parameters 
such that so there really are uh, three scales that we could in principle choose independently. One is given by the coupling, the other by the mass, and the other by the compactification scale. And here, since we're interested in the convergence with E max, we simply take them all to be of the same order. And we just take E max large, that gives us the biggest, uh, you know, biggest computational range. And so we can really see whether the convergence is as expected. So here, the crossed lines are what I call the raw. So there, that's the one where we don't include any improvements and we expect a one over E max squared error. And you see that that, that fits. And then here's the improved, okay, where we add this one extra term that I calculated some of in front of you, and we get this much more flat line. This is what's a function of E max, okay? All right, and you can't really tell very much from, uh, from this because, you know, any curve looks like one over E max to the anything. So here I plotted the residual as a function of one over E max squared, and you can see that it's, and it's blown up a lot. And you can see it's very much a straight line. Notice that it's only changing in the third decimal place here. Okay, so this is actually very accurate. And then here is the improved, okay, which is going like one over the max cube. Okay, so you can see that it really is, and that was, I'm not fitting to that power. That power was predicted by this, this power point. Okay, and here I'm showing the same thing, the blown up version. For the some of the excited states, what I showed before was for the the excitation energy of the first excited state. Okay, here are some higher excited states uh, for Z two even states, I guess, and it keeps working just fine. And again, you got if you look very carefully, you would see that the scale here is not as fine as the scale here. Okay, so you are losing some accuracy, but you definitely see the the scaling very clearly. Okay. Now uh, I chose some funny values for the coupling. We claim that lambda over four pi is the right quantity to tell you how strongly coupled the theory is. Uh, we chose that to be essentially one. Before you might say, well, is that really strong coupling? Maybe what you're seeing is just beautiful convergence where you have weak coupling perturbation theory. So here we show some of the energy. Uh, uh, eigenvalues as a function of lambda, and you can see here are the free values, and you can see by the time you get to, I don't know, two and four, this is extremely strongly coupled. In fact, there's a critical coupling here. The critical point is around 5.5 uh, or something, according to other people. We're not claiming to extract that. And, you know, there, there's a very beautiful relation. We know that the the, the, the energy eigenvalues in units of the radius give you the conformal dimension at the fixed point, right? And this is supposed to be the icing model. And so here are the first few, you know, icing model uh, uh, dimensions. And you see that these states are nicely going at least near what they're supposed to be doing at that critical point, okay? Now, uh, I don't want to claim at all any kind of accuracy here because remember we still have a very small radius okay and so uh, that would be interesting actually to see how accurately we can extrapolate those uh, okay so you can see that uh, and, and here is just a plot that shows that the convergence keeps working even to very large values of lambda so all the way up to here I'm going up to lambda equals eight which is way way over there on that thing and even there we see good evidence for this uh, convergence with one of the max cube. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to say, I'm going to have to take one minute <laughs> and just say something about gauge theory because uh, I think we really want to do something with gauge theory. And I've been, I've been thinking about that. So I'll just say something very quickly about that. Um, so in lattice gauge theory, gauge invariance is very easy. You just have manifest gauge invariance on the last. But there's a price that you pay for that, right? Which is uh, chiral fermions, right? You, you know that gauge invariance cannot be easy for theories with chiral fermions because there's some weird restriction on the fermion representations. And so the way the lattice gauge theory squirms out of that is you don't get chiral fermions, period. Okay. And so if you want chiral fermions, you have to, you have to. Twist yourself into knots. 
So Hamiltonian truncation is the opposite in a sense, because gauge invariance is hard. What gauge invariance means is you have to gauge fix all the way to the physical Hilbert state, okay? And that is hard, okay? You have to, at that stage already, you have to face anomalies directly, okay? If you have fermions. On the other hand, once you do that, that's all you have to do, okay? There's nothing more. Then the chiral fermions are just easy. They're just already included, okay? But it's this step that's hard, okay? And so uh, we've taken some baby steps in this direction. So we do believe that we understand the gauge fixing completely and we understand the anomalies. Okay. Now there are some issues involving the Lorentz invariance and numerics. Right now, our numerics don't make sense. <laughs> so, but uh, so I can't tell you for sure that we have everything right, but that's kind of where we are. I think that we'll be able to do at least 2 d one gauge theory. And that means including chiral gauge theory. And I believe that even on the lattice, even though it's 2D, I don't think you can do chiral 2D gauge theory on the lattice. So this would be the first, you know, first chiral gauge theory that you could actually explore numerically. Okay. Okay, so my conclusions, these are somewhat pretentious conclusions, but I am extremely excited by this. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that Ken Wilson, uh, two of his greatest achievements were to define lattice gauge theory and also to give us a modern understanding of effective field theory and the renormalization group because these things are actually intimately connected uh, if you're interested in the fact that lattice gauge theory is an effective theory is extremely important conceptually right and it underlies everything that we do with uh, on the lattice okay and so uh, we're now i believe that hamiltonian truncation has an effective field theory interpretation and i believe that that's the main thing that we really need to get to, to make progress um, i have a whole bunch of projects uh, that, I'm, that i want to do on this um, uh, there's lots of work to be done you know i always say for in every project there's a there's a holy grail goal and then there's you know an achievable goal the first of these are very much achievable they're just hard work uh, we want to take 2d54 to one higher order that's conceptually interesting because at that level we start seeing both non-hermeticity and non-locality. Okay. And so to see that the we want to see that the expansion still works in that case. 3D lambda 5-4 is a theory with UV divergences that has logs and infinite renormalization and so on. Uh, 2D U1 chiral gauge theory. Uh, at this point, I think and 3D U1 chiral gauge theory, or sorry, chiral doesn't really make sense. I don't know why I have that there. 3D gauge theory. Uh, these are all very much doable things, just take hard work. Uh, these other things are things that are aspirational. Non abelian gauge theory is a lot harder because gauge fixing is a lot harder in the non abelian case. Quantum computing, and eventually, someday, 4D QCD. And my unofficial motto these days is lattice gauge theory, we are coming for you. Okay, thank you. Questions. Yeah, please. So, in the models that you've looked at, there is a various, very obvious uh, separate choice of what is H naught and what is B. Right. But I would think that in general, that could make a huge difference because how you separate that is defining what your basis yeah. is for. Yeah, we, we did explore that a little bit. Even in this model, you can do something very modest, which is to put some of the mass into the interaction term, uh -huh. right? And we did that. And you can see that the, the stupid choice that we made is pretty much the optimal choice, at least for the parameters that we explored. But yeah, you can, you can think of those as additional variational parameters, if you like, right? Because you're changing your basis by changing your H naught, you're changing your basis. And so it's kind of like whenever you have a variational, different variational ansatz, the one that works best is the best. I mean, <laughs> and you know, it just turns out that this normal ordered mass is a pretty good proxy to the actual mass that you get at the, you know, in, in non perturbatively. And that's kind of what you expect 
you would expect that the best mass parameter is one that's close to the sort of physical mass, non perturbative mass parameter. But, you know, we, we don't have that many uh, exactly solved H knots, right? So we have three field theory, we have 2D minimal models. That's it, right? Pretty much, I think. So, you know, in practice, there's not that much freedom, I don't think. Okay, thanks for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.